Mohin Mir is a writer of both non-fiction and fiction. He began writing under the influence of his grandfather, who was a scholar of Sufi Sufism, Omar Khayyam, and Mirza Ghalib. His latest book, which is right there at the back, is The Lost Fragrance of Infinity. It's a novel glowing with the essence of Sufism. It was marked as the top five reads by Times of India. His first non-fiction book, Surat, Fall of a Port, Rise of a Prince, was also published in the UK as the prince who beat the empire. His literary career began when he assisted in translating more than a hundred letters written by Mirza Ghalib from Urdu to English. Fluent in Urdu and Persian, Mohin speaks regularly at leading international literature festivals on topics ranging from Sufism, history, and travel writing. He lives in London with his wife, Leonie, who's also here amongst us. Welcome, Leonie. An art and ceramics curator, and welcome, Mohin. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for turning up today. Uh, it's an uh, extraordinary place to be uh, speaking about Sufism. Uh, I grew up in Bombay, so there's a sense of nostalgia every time I return, um, and this this kind of ambience, uh, you know, does much to trigger that. Also, Dr. Little, thank you so much for your your wonderful um, your wonderful lecture. Um, and, you know, I'm sure all of us will agree we learned so much from it. Um, Sufism is, is, uh, is a vast ocean, and to try and, you know, encapsulate it in 45 minutes or in a presentation is, uh, is next to impossible. Uh, my little humble tribute to Sufism has found itself in, in a novel, uh, which I hope you might, might, uh, might, you know, kind of take a look at. Um, but I decided to title my talk, uh, The Sufi Mind, A Flight of Curiosity and Love, because I'm sure at some point in time in your lives you've all encountered Sufism in some way, uh, either listening to a Kavali or, you know, having visited a shrine or uh, tied a, a little thread for, for, a, uh, for a wish to be, come, you know, to be brought to fruition by the saint. But Sufism is so, so deep that those aspects that we have encountered in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives are, are literally just the peripheral out fringes, if you wish, of Sufism. Um, so uh, I thought I'd start with this slide, which is the moon. And that crater that you see, which I've marked there, is a crater called Al-Sufi. And it was named Al-Sufi by the, the International Space uh, Fraternity in honor of this fine gentleman here called Abdul Rahman Al-Sufi. Abdul Rahman Al-Sufi was, 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 was an interesting character who lived in 10th century Iran. And he uh, basically was the first to identify the Andromeda galaxy. And uh, that started with, uh, with his curiosity in mathematics and astronomy. Not astrology, but astronomy. Deeply inspired by Brahma Gupt, who was uh, the Indian mathematician who lived uh, you know, 100, 120 years before him. So uh, the flight of the Sufi mind in terms of curiosity and love is, uh, is a flight of the fertility of this mind, which takes the Sufi into understanding science, mathematics, philosophy. And then I'll tr hopefully try and draw you back into the Sufism that we encounter in South Asia, as well as in Iran. But just to look at their contributions uh, in science and philosophy, let's just stay with the likes of Abdul Rahman al-Sufi. Um, another giant in, in the space of science and mathematics is this gentleman called Omar Khayyam. Um, Omar Khayyam uh, lived again in Iran, in Nishapur, uh, born and raised there uh, in the 12th century. And uh, he wrote this fantastic book called the Rubaiyat, which is um, poetry dedicated to God, often misinterpreted as dedicated to the love of a woman, but dedicated to God, I can assure you. Uh, but such was the flight of this Sufi's mind that he started exploring mathematics and went on to become uh, a stalwart mathematician of his era. 
he went on to calculate the, 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 the amount of days in the year to the 12th decimal point, which we use today. He also invented modern day cubic equations and at the same time wrote the Rubaiyat. So you can imagine this, this incredible mind that we are now foraying into, the Sufi mind where mathematics and, and science and mysticism is all merging together. And that's why it's so difficult to write about Sufism or understand it in its entirety. The next person that I wanted to speak to you about is, is this gentleman who lived in between Andalusia, which is southern Spain, and North Africa. His name is Ibn Khaldun. He lived in the 14th century and is generally regarded as one of the greatest Sufi thinkers of all time because he went on to become the father of social sciences. Um, and um, I'm sure Dr. Little might appreciate this because he started this belief within historians not just to look at history as a chronology of dates, but as a science. What goes into understanding history as well as geography as a social science. Um, Ibn Khaldun uh, advised the, the sultans of, uh, of various uh, sultanates, particularly uh, the last of the uh, 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 rulers of Andalusia in Spain. He lived in Morocco, in Tunisia, uh, had a burning desire to come to India, but never made it. Uh, but his contributions uh, in terms of the Muqaddimah, which is the book right at the top, uh, is, is, uh, is astonishingly uh, well received in the West even today and is hailed as a landmark in trying to understand the science of history. And then his writings on Sufism, uh, the mystical form of Islam, received, um, received much, much praise as well. Moving on from Ibn Khaldun, we come to uh, unimpeachably and incontestably the greatest Sufi mind of all time, Ibn al-Arabi. Um, and his forte was not uh, necessarily science or mathematics, but it was pure philosophy, the understanding of metaphysics, um, the, the concept of existence, what is it to exist, the concept of essence, uh, you know, how does essence and existence comes together. And I know it's a complicated sounding uh, proposition, but he comes up uh, inspired by Aristotle and Plato by the concept, with a concept called the unity of being, which is also known as Wahadatul Wajud. Uh, which basically means uh, 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 everything that you see and touch is one. So a chair that you're sitting on is one, your body is one, and uh, a plant is one, and so you're correlating it backwards to the, to the concept of one creator. Um, it's a bit of a, you know, many scholars have tried to understand him and write about him. Uh, a leading scholar of Ibn Arab Arabi once said that whoever claims to have understood him is, is completely wrong is, or is a liar. So, you know, that's the kind of mental space that Ibn Arabi occupies. Um, we then come to a, a very interesting gentleman called Ibn Tufel. Uh, Ibn Tufel lived again in Andalusia, which is southern Spain, in the, in the 12th century, um, <clears throat> and is credited to have written a, a fabulous book called Hai Ibn Yaqzan, which basically means awake, son of awake. Uh, and it's an internal awakening to understand that you are one with the cosmos. This book went on to become the inspiration for the writing of Robinson Crusoe, which followed nearly 700 years later. Now, so we've looked at science, we've looked at mathematics, we've looked at philosophy. Then we burst into, which I think a large number of you have, have, have engaged with or even experienced, which is um, Sufi poetry. And um, we, we now start looking at a galaxy or a constellation of, of, of brilliant poets that are emerging from Hafiz to Rumi, whom we've all heard of, Saadi, Farid al-Din Attar, Sana'i, um, and then, of course, closer to home in Delhi, Khusro. All of these stalwart poets um, start inhabiting a mind space where uh, they have fallen in love with the divine creator, and they start using metaphor 
to express their love for the divine creator. That metaphor could be a glass of wine, it could be the arched eyebrow of a beautiful woman, it could be her hair, uh, but leading from there, they are expressing their, their expressions of love for the divine. Um, but I thought I'd take a deeper dive into understanding where are the origins of curiosity. And that took me to the pillars of Sufism. Um, I mean, there are many pillars of Sufism. Some people say there are nearly 50 pillars, but I won't bore you with all 50. I've just selected, um, I think, about five or six pillars of Sufism. And these are, these are the, uh, the origins of curiosity uh, and the origins of imagination based on their understanding of the Quran, based on their understanding of the Upanishads. And from there, they burst into this, this space of inquiring why, how, when. The first pillar of Sufism uh, that drives curiosity is the concept of Tawheed, which is the one. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Ibn al-Arabi's writing of Wahadatul Wajud, which is uh, everything is one, uh, and that pulls back into the originator or the first mover that remains unmoved, which is the one. That, that uh, the ingredients of the one are then present in everything that the one manifests itself in. So whether it's a plant or an animal or, 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 or a human being. But the origins of curiosity stem from there. So if we are one with the one, you know, how do we look at science or bi and biology and mathematics and all of that through that lens? Um, and this is summed up by a beautiful poem by Seh Bedruddin, who's, who's, a, who's a 15th century poet. And, and it's a beautiful verse which I've used in my novel. Ecstasy came to me and I remained in wonderment at God's presence. I was lost in emotion. One day I saw my body as God in his entirety. The mystic who has perceived God loses his feelings. He is one with the mountain and streams. He spreads to the whole universe. Everything is just a single moment. And you can see that these, these, these fantastic poets, uh, these Sufi poets, are being inspired by stalwarts way before them. For example, the Upanishads. In the Upanishads, it's clearly mentioned the Brahman is the one. Plato uh, talks about the one as it is without color and shape, the subject of all knowledge. The study of the one is the greatest study. Aristotle, everything is one. The unmovable first mover is single. And Plotinus, who went on to become the father of Neoplatonism, says, it is by the one that all beings are beings. So that's the first pillar of Sufism, uh, pulling elements from Islam, from Greek mythology, Greek philosophy, and of course the Upanishads as well. Um, and then we come to the second pillar, um, which I think is the most beautiful pillar, Takhlik Ba Ishq, which is basically creation through love. Takhlik is creation and Ishq. I don't need to, man, you know, I don't need to explain Ishq. Um, and, and this is where you see freedom of expression really flowing now in, in, in Sufi poetry. Um, Saadi Shirazi, who's a poet from Iran, writes, God created creation because he wanted to be loved. And he's injecting God with, an, with, with a sense of the necessity of wanting to be loved. So even God has feelings and desires to be loved. And that's how far the Sufis start pushing this, this, uh, the boundaries of their relationship with God. Uh, Nizamuddin Olya says, God is to be loved, not to be feared. Um, but then we come to something which is really interesting. This is where the Sufi mind starts infiltrating a space which the clerics start actually calling uh, heresy or blasphemy. Because this is when the Sufis start looking at metaphor, the beauty of a woman, uh, her hair, her eyes, her eyebrows, and start using that as a first step to, to, to show their dedication toward the created um, through the creator. And this is Ibn al-Arabi at his, at his fantastic best. Ibn al-Arabi is in Mecca. He falls in love with a woman called Nizam, and he writes for her, in the fever of love, separation kills. Finding her would ease the burning. The tender bend of her neck as she turns, she extends a hand as soft as undyed silk in musk. 
Now, there's a huge sense of sensuality in this and eroticism, but it's not just confined to uh, a physical love for Nizam. He's imbuing Nizam with the manifestations of God. And um, then, of course, there's Hafiz. Uh, Hafiz is basically a title given to a great poet called Shamsuddin. Hafiz means someone who had learned the Quran by heart. Uh, and yet you see this fertility of mind where he's seeking God. And Hafiz had fallen in love with a woman who had the most beautiful name, shah nabat which meant a branch of sugarcane. And, and for her, he writes, those charming brows arched like the heavenly bow, arm not with such disdain, drive not one already sunk low, hopeless to mourn his never ceasing pain. And you know, you see uh, the, the beauty of, of this never ceasing pain that Hafiz is trying to say, uh, he's separated from shah nabat but he's also separated from the one who created shah nabat who is God. Um, ever so often, you must have uh, heard kawals and kawalis, and ever so often, you will find the kawal raising his index finger, bearing witness to the tawhid, which is the one creator. Now, you see this burst of devotional art and music coming out of this fertile, curious mind. To the right is a, is a wonderful miniature painting, which uh, if you happen to visit the Metropolitan uh, uh, Museum in New York, uh, it is most captivating. The colors are to die for. But this is the depiction of um, a story in the Quran and the story in, in the Old Testament. It's the story of love between Yusuf and Zulekha. Uh, Yusuf is this devastatingly handsome prophet, and Zulekha is this you know, princess who falls in love with this young man. Uh, he's younger than her, and she tries to lure him and seduce him, um, chasing him from room to room. And you can actually see Yusuf trying to flee and Zulekha trying to reach out to him. Um, and Yusuf is running away because he thinks it's just pure carnal desire that's emanating out of, uh, out of Zulekha. And he, he rejects her. She, in turn, uh, accuses him of all kinds of things, and he's, the poor guy is locked up in jail and all of that. Eventually, as time passes, he teaches her the meaning of love, which is the love for the divine, the love for loving each other's soul rather than carnal desire, and eventually merging with Allah or God. Um, and this, this spectacle, if you wish, is captured brilliantly by a Sufi painter called Kamaluddin Bezad, who lived in the 16th century in Herat. Uh, and it's so tragic that one can't go to Herat today um, and see the, the museum, uh, 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 which was once the atelier of Kamaluddin Bezad. So the point that I'm trying to make is that because of takhliq ba ishq, which is creation through love, you see this burst of devotional art and music, which starts becoming, in that, that starts being, being titled as Sufi uh, devotional art and music. Um, the third pillar that I wanted to talk to you about was tasawuf, or the inward journey. Here the Sufi urges one to go within and understands one's soul, understands one's presence in, in, in today's day and age and today's world, and what is your role, what is your need? Are you here just to look at your Excel spreadsheets? Are you just here to look at your profit margins? Are you here just to you know, do your duty as a good son and a, and a daughter? What's your core purpose of being here? And eventually, they come to the conclusion that it's to do basic good, just simple good. But that's understood by a, a, a fabulous poem, um, which was written by uh, a, a Sufi called Fariduddin Attar. And it's a, it's a wonderful poem about uh, birds. It's called The Conference of Birds, where he uses birds as a metaphor to understand God. And all the birds look around, and they say, animals have a king, the lion you know, every human kingdom has a king. Why don't we, the birds, have a king? And so let's go and fly to this mountain called Tar, looking for our king, who is the Simurg. Um, and so these birds fly, and they reach the mountain Tar, eventually realizing that God realize, lives within, and they don't have to lo look for a king. A king lives within you. And there's this beautiful uh, verse from Fariduddin Attar, which is in Farsi, but I, you know, it's translated in, uh, in English by Arbery. All who reflecting as reflected see, 
themselves in me and me in them. Not me, but all of me, that a contracted I is comprehensive of infinity. Come, you lost atoms, to your center draw and be that eternal mirror that you saw. Um, Tasawuf also um, leads you to a stage of destruction of ego. And this is where the greatest uh, uh, Sufi poet, in terms of at least destruction of ego, Jalaluddin Rumi, um, has, has, has risen to great heights. So if you see the, the whirling dervish, you will see one open palm and the other palm is dropped. It's about receiving and giving, generosity. Uh, the, the caps that they wear are tombstones of their ego, which is destruction of, of, uh, of anything that has to do with um, aspiring to be bigger than someone who's next to you or, or inflicting your ego on someone else. Um, <clears throat> and Rumi's greatest uh, poem, at least as far as destruction of ego goes, is something like this. See how in pride they go, with lifted head till fate with a sudden blow smitted them dead. Flowers every night, blossom in the sky, peace in the infinite, at peace am I. Um, coming closer to home, um, this is a Sufi that you must have all heard of because he, uh, his, his shrine in Ajmer uh, in Rajasthan is, is uh, un, un, incontestably you know, the greatest Sufi um, pilgrimage site for, for many people in India. And he pioneered the fourth pillar of Sufism, which is khidmat e khalq selfless service to humanity. Uh, and, and one of his most famous sayings goes, be a person who has river-like charity, sun-like affection, earth-like generosity towards all, be it Christian, Hindu, Jew, or Muslim, by Muinuddin Chishti. Um, and the final pillar of Sufism, which I thought I'll hopefully try and end my um, rather long talk with, is Tawazun, and I'm going to try and balance this talk as well. Um, tawazun is, is vital. Everything is in Tawazun, in balance, from a planet to, you know, to, to the way you walk, to the way you sit, and balance in everything uh, that, you, that, you, that you consume, uh, in nutrition, to the way you study, everything is vital, uh, is vitally driven by the concept of balance. Sorry, one more pillar. Um, the last one, Iqra, which is um, read, which is the first uh, revelation of the Quran, and also, um, a, a, a deeper meaning that the Sufis took to heart. Um, love for spirituality, love for scientific study, and knowledge. And uh, this is, in my opinion, uh, my, you know, one of Hafiz's greatest verses. He's written an in immense amount, but the, this short poem speaks uh, so much. Of this fierce glow which love and you within my breast inspire, the sun is but a spark that flew and set the heavens afire. And um, you know, every time I read this 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 line, it it, uh, it 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 springs with so many different meanings. It's about education. It's about knowledge. It's about seeking. It's about understanding yourself. It's about understanding that you can rise to such heights that the sun will just be a mere spark. And today, what we've accomplished in space technology is precisely that. So, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that is that is um, what Sufism is. And to try and write about it was the most daunting task that I had faced. Um, and, and I took another route. I realized that if I write an academic book, I would fall flat, especially in, in the face of uh, historians and academics. So I chose the route of a novel, a novel of a human story that could appeal to uh, practically everyone. So my novel is called um, uh, The Lost Fragrance of Infinity. And it's inspired by the tiles of infinity that you see all the way from Andalusia in Spain right up to Delhi. And this was an art form that the Sufis uh, propagated, uh, they built, and they um, really took to heart. Uh, it's an art form that, 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 that required mastery in mathematics and geometry, and at the same time, uh, a real skill to bring beauty to life. Um, 
And so my journey for the novel began at uh, Hazrat Nizamuddin Olia, which is in Delhi. Um, and it was a search uh, for art as a metaphor of love and for humanity. Uh, you know, how do I look for a, 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 a poem or, or, or a manuscript or a piece of art that I could then use to imbue my character uh, with certain qualities and then take that character on a journey through which you could see the beauty of Sufism. And as I traveled through Fatehpur Sikri, hung out with the Kavals and visited Humayun's tomb, and finally a, a, a small um, monument called Dilkusha, and that's where it struck me when I saw these beautiful geometric tiles on, on the bottom left of the, of the screen, uh, that I could weave a story around geometry, about mathematics, about art, and all the contributions that Sufism has, pay, has made uh, to, these, to these wonderful uh, um, sciences. So the novel, in many ways, became a search for art as a metaphor for love for humanity. And it's only when I landed up in this small town called Bursa, which is in Anatolia, uh, overshadowed completely by the magic of Istanbul, that I found the code to my novel. I was in this mosque called the Yesel Kami Mosque, just visiting it, and I encountered this Sufi uh, actually sitting there um, it was, it was a cold Sunday morning. There was no one in the mosque. Su sunlight was beaming through the stained glass windows. And he was sitting all alone, moving his prayer beads. He smiled at me, and I just had a conversation with him, which was about these fantastic tiles that I was seeing running across the panel work of this mosque. And um, he spoke very little English, so he pulled a translator. And as I quizzed him about these tiles, he said, what do you see? And I was you know, completely uh, puzzled. I said, well, I don't know. Uh, they're beautiful tiles. And he said, no, look closer. And um, I didn't have an answer. And he said, every shape, hexagon, square, star, pentagon, um, these are the different races. These are the different languages. These are the different people that walk this earth, different races, different creeds, different castes. But if we come together, and we seek enlightenment, which is that star right in the middle, then we can become a more enlightened lot. And so these tiles are a representation of that constant quest for, for spiritual bliss if mankind can bind together and come together. And these then become uh, the designs of infinity. And that's where I got my title, and that's where I got the inspiration for the novel. Um, that took me to Andalusia which was the final point of, my, uh, of, 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 of the journey uh, for the tile maker, who's the protagonist of my book. And, um, you know, I was struck by, I, when I saw the tiles here in, in, uh, in the Alhambra, they are exactly the same shapes as the, as the shapes in the Jali work, if I may use that work, word because I'm not an art historian, in Humayun's tomb. The only difference is that they are tiles, and in Humayun's tomb in Delhi, uh, they are made out of stonework. Um, so my story, the story in my novel is of a tile maker who leaves Delhi in 1739, uh, having lost the lover, uh, his shakhe nabat, if you wish, and eventually finds himself in Spain and rediscovers himself through Sufi philosophy. So that's, uh, that's my book and that's me. Thank you. Sorry, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Sure. Um, yeah, it, that's that's in, you know that's a uh, that's a question that is so uh, it, it's it's deeply debated. The word suf in Arabic and in Farsi they say means uh, wool, um, and and the Sufis uh, wore a parched uh, woolen kind of uh, mantle, and some say they derived it from that. Um, some say it's the word that was given to the backbenchers who sat and listened to the Prophet. Uh, as the Prophet Muhammad was actually giving his lectures and sermons, the ones who were the most creative were not sitting in the front bench, were sitting at the back bench. And the word Sufi, uh, you know, basically means the one who's creative. So uh, there are, there's a wide spectrum of, 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 uh, of you know, meanings to the word, and, and its origins are debated. But yeah. Sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, uh, and I think you addressed it already, you know, religion, right? Obviously what you're talking about in some senses is spirituality, not religion. I'm a Muslim by birth. Uh, on page two, I closed the Quran because it said something about God getting angry. <laughs> now, God's no fool, right? And I think you touched on it in one of your slides that it's really about love, not about uh, obedience or fear or anything like that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned something about the, one of the scholars uh, talking about the science of history. Could you just elaborate on ah, that? Yes. Um, that's Ibn Khaldun. And um, he was an extraordinary man. Um, he lived in the 14th century. He was born uh, um, in, in Tangiers, in Morocco, uh, and spent a lot of time floating between North Africa and southern Spain. And uh, he wrote a book called the Muqaddimah, which in English means the introduction. And he introduces the concept of history as a science rather than, um, rather than just a chronology of dates. And <clears throat> the core concept that he uses is something called asabia, which means group solidarity. And he weaves his argument around that and he says that any time a group pulls together with a common goal, a common, uh, he uses the word hadaf, which is the common goal. It binds together, and that's how empires rise and fall. And when they lose Asabia, uh, th that, that's when the decline will, will start setting in. And so he uses that as a science to kind of understand the rise and fall of empires. And I would you know, recommend you read Mukaddima. It's a wonderful book. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for an <clears throat> excellent exposition. You know, it's really, really, I mean, you covered a wide, vast area in such a short time. Uh, I just wanted your views on Dara Shiko, Sufism, Upanishads. You know, I, I, I thought you would mention something about it, but it would be nice to hear from you, your thoughts about it. Thank you. I hope you'll buy my book, sir. Dara Shiko and the Upanishads are mentioned in the introduction. I will, I will. <laughs> um, Dara Shiko was, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a historian. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm standing in front of one of India's stalwart historians, so please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Little. But Dara Shiko was a, a very unique man. He was given to the Qadriya uh, Silsila of Sufism, and he was... Um, one of the first, if not the first, to translate the Upanishads into Persian. And the reason he did that is because he, he, he quite, uh, you know, unequivocally writes in Majma al-Bahrain, which is a book that he writes as well, uh, that he doesn't want the Muslims of India not to know the Upanishads. So that is his core goal. Um, the Upanishads, he's struck by the Upanishads because the Upanishads, according to him, is very similar to the Quran, where it talks about Tawheed, the oneness of God, the one, the one creator, and it doesn't digress from there. So that's what really inspires him to translate the Upanishads. He also goes on to call the Upanishads the Sire Akbar, which is uh, the hidden secret. And um, in the Quran, there is a book that is mentioned called the Hidden Book. And he goes even a step further to say that that book that is mentioned in the Quran, which is the Hidden Book, is the Upanishads. He further goes on to write a book called Majma al Bahrain, which tries to show the similarity between, Hinduism's, between Hinduism and Islam uh, when viewed through the lens of the Upanishads. Um, you know, and, and so yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much what Darashiko's uh, goal was in life. Um, you mentioned, uh, like among the principles of Sufism, uh, you mentioned something about uh, the unity of beings. Yes. Where uh, everyone is uh, part of the one and things like that. So doesn't that make Sufism kind of like pantheism? Uh, because yeah. then there's also this principle of Tawheed, which is actually monotheism. Very true. And uh, Ibn al-Arabi, who, uh, who wrote about uh, the unity of being, Wahadatul Wajud, uh, his books were burnt in Bukhara. 
because he was accused of being panthe uh, uh, you know, a follower of pantheism, when actually, in fact, uh, it, is, it is nothing but monotheism. Because what it actually says is that the unity of being is, your, is the original creator. What he then terms, which is tajalli, is the manifestation of that one creator into everything else that has been created. And uh, it's a difficult concept to understand because you're, very, you're, you're, you're right. You know, once you start going down that track where you say God is in everything, then everything is, 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 is God, everything can be worshipped, and then you get into a, a problem between ma uh, monotheism and, and pantheism. And that's, that's the ground where Ibn Arabi becomes so uh, difficult to understand in terms of what is the stand that he's taking. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not middle ground. He's still very deeply entrenched in monotheism. All he's trying to say is that the one creator um, has got his essences everywhere and everywhere and uh, anywhere. And he leaves it at that. You know, he doesn't go on to explain anything any further. So it's, it's, um, it, it's a gray area. Sure. Yes. Um, and before I shed light on Shams, I'll just come back to the most important word uh, um, which compelled me to write it as a novel rather than a, a, an academic uh, a piece of work because I very quickly realized that you, can't, you cannot write about ishq. Um, you know, uh, academically. And Ishq is exactly what Shams uh, and, and Rumi had. Um, Rumi was a theologian. Uh, the word Rumi is today used very loosely, and I don't like it, to be very fair. You get WhatsApp messages with a text saying, said by Rumi, which is completely untrue. Rumi was a devout Muslim. He was a five times praying Muslim. His title is Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, which means he was, a, he was a Maulana, he was a preaching Muslim. What made Rumi different is that he had a creative mind and he fell in love with God. He didn't fear him and he broke down those barriers. Now, for Rumi to reach a level where he could take that love of God and make it more accessible to himself, he needed a teacher. And he needed a guide. It couldn't be just be done, you know, uh, on whims and fancies. And Sufism, in Sufism, you need a guide. And that's where Shams comes in. The story goes uh, that Rumi uh, was, was, was a man who, who thought of himself as uh, very learned. And he was in the marketplace um, giving a sermon. And he saw Shams walking past. And he was just struck by the beauty of this man and what this man, uh, you know, the, the personality of this man. During a conversation, he happens to tell Shams at Tabrez uh, how knowledgeable he is. Not so, uh, you know, boldly, but, but, but in hidden terms. And Shams takes his books and throws them into the river. And, uh, you know, Rumi is, is, is distraught. And that's when Shams touches his heart leads him away, and that's when that relationship with Shams Tabrez begins, which is a more soul-to-soul -soul connect. Once again, in love of the divine, not necessarily only devoted to the love of each other. And I think that's also a line that gets blurred, where a lot of Hafiz and Rumi's poetry is thought of as in love for your girlfriend or, or, your, or, or a beautiful woman. It can be that, but it is deeper and beyond that. And that's the relationship between Shams and uh, Rumi. Actually, that just comes from the other um, the question you just asked, which is, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier Hafiz and Ibn al Arabi as well about their, and you mentioned that those particular uh, verses are actually, you know, there is reference to, or, or or there is a tradition which says that these people had a woman as a sort of, shall we say, love interest or a muse. Or a muse, yes. Yeah. You know, they are there. Oh, yes. So where does that tradition come in? I mean, is this in the original writings of these people? 
Or is this a tradition that develops later? Where does this tradition connected with Rumi and Shams come in? Where, when does this, I mean, it's a historian's question. When yeah, yeah. does this develop? <laughs> you know, is this there? Uh, you know, is this, uh, you know, is this there in the original uh, texts of those period, of very, that period? Very much so. Uh, Ibn al-Arabi uh, writes two incredible books. One is Fatut al makya which means revelations during my visit, my stay in Makkah. And the second book that he writes is uh, Interpretations of Desire, um, uh, Ashfaq al-Ashik, which basically means, uh, you know, how do I interpret desire? And, but, so yes, these 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 uh, metaphors are very much there in their writings. I mean, you know, Rumi writes extensively about Shams, and he talks about how the light of his life has gone away with the departure of Shams. So it's very much there in their divan, in, particularly in Rumi's divan, and it is very much there in Ibn al Arabi's work, uh, works as well. But to answer your question specifically, it comes at a later part in their life. If you look at Ibn al-Arabi or Rumi or even Hafiz, they start off being um, uh, as, as um, extremely, um, I wouldn't say dogged, but, but extremely confined. And then as life progresses, their encounters with these beautiful people, women or men, encourages them to look at, um, at beauty and at love through that lens, rather than just the lens of dogged, uh, you know, writings. Yeah, yeah. We have to learn to love. Yeah. You've mentioned all these books written by these poets. Um, are they? available? Uh, are they all translated in yes. English? Would we be able to understand them? Yes, absolutely. A large number of scholars have translated Ibn al-Arabi. Uh, a huge number of uh, scholars have translated Rumi. I would recommend Nicholson and Arbery for, for Rumi. They're genuinely authentic translations after having read the Divan and then br uh, learned Farsi. Uh, it's impossible to translate Rumi if you haven't learned Farsi. So Arbery and Nicholson, I would recommend for, uh, for Hafiz and Rumi. And uh, for Ibn al-Arabi, um, uh, Whittaker. Uh, so there's a doc uh, Dr. Whittaker is, is, is brilliant in, uh, if you want to read Ibn al-Arabi. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.